Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Hello, Pete. Can you hear me? Shan, I can, brother. Good morning, my friend. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Really good. It must be early in the morning for you. It is 5.30 a.m. So, uh, yeah, I usually get up around <laughs> <Mike>. this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm usually rolling over and thinking, oh, is it I want Dude, What the <laughs> fuck is that boy doing at 5.30 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds like you're pretty motivated, mate. I had a look at your site and all the stuff you get up to. So, uh, no, mate. Yeah, you know, I'm it's... Um, these price. these conversations and things like this are really, really important to me. And I'm very, very interested in trying to you know, just to share them with as many people as possible. I'm so conscious that we are losing the opportunity day by day that uh, I don't want to lose these opportunities. You know, people are retiring so quick these days and we're, we're, we're going to miss these opportunities. So I really, really appreciate your time. And uh, I always want to make sure we try and do a great job with these. Okay. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous, actually. <laughs> no, don't be bloody daft, mate. You don't, and I know that's a secret compliment because, like, you could do this standing on your head. I'm really fascinated to to get into our conversation and talk about, like, the places you've gone, the people you've spoken to, and, and kind of why this whole thing got started, really. I mean, so for, if we could just start with, like, a little whistle-stop um, tour of where you're from, and then we'll kind of get into the background of the career. Okay, so I'm from Brisbane, Australia, state of Queensland. Um, I joined the fire service in 1983, and I served 38 years uh, in the fire service, in mostly in Brisbane, and recently retired about a year ago. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. Just retired. So, I mean, that must have been, let's, mm. let's kind of start there, I suppose. That must have been a surreal time because... 38 years is probably what most people are going to be looking at these days. I've done 18 years so far. I'm 33. So I'm probably going to do another 25 or something years. But, you know, gone are the days where people are just doing 25 years. Congratulations on your retirement. Yeah. And kind of how does it feel um, moving into this next well, big chapter feel, of life? It feels, yeah, look, it feels great. The timing was right for me. Um I think except another guy said to me, oh, Sham, why don't you hang on for two more years and, and get 40 years up? But I'm thinking, no, no, I've, I've had enough. Um, I turned uh, 60, actually just 61 when I retired. And wow. so I really wanted to have enough energy and enough time left to be able to pursue my passion of the compartment fire behavior training. And I thought, the oh, time's ticking away. If I stay another couple of years, when I could go to 65. But if mm-hmm. I do that then I'm not going to have, you know, it's going to be a little bit old, a little long in the tooth, you're wearing breathing apparatus and crawling around and, and sort of, um, you know, burning shipping containers. Mate, I find it incredible that you're able to continue to go to that age because I honestly think that you're one of those great examples of somebody that's probably kept a good eye on your physical health and well-being over those years because when I look at some of the lads and, and lasses in their 20s and 30s now, I'm not sure they'll still be able to do that in 25 years how have you found your yeah. body kind of changing moving into that later stage of your career and you've obviously you know you stay in shape you've been able to keep doing it yeah well it doesn't get any easier that's for sure i, I must admit that um, in the later part of my 50 say 58 59 everything started to feel heavier you know, the coil of hose <laughs> felt <Yeah>. heavier <laughs> um, you know the 64 felt heavier everything you know felt heavier but you know i still find i can do um, everything that I used to do, but obviously I've got to pace myself and be careful and got a few little injuries here and there. Uh, my knee was one that, that played up for me earlier in the year. It's an old mm. injury, but I, I've sort of tried to stay uh, 
Bruce is active. I mean, no one here is active as what, what you are. No one here is fit as what you are. But Yeah, but you've you got know, 25 years days. on me, so I don't think I'm going to make it to where you are. You, but the, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but like, mm. It's, it's bu- being fit and healthy in your 20s is bullshit. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's fit and healthy mm. in their 20s. And then in their 30s, it's kind of here and there. In the 40s, 50s, a lot of people drop off and, and land on the graveyard of, oh, I used to be a fit firefighter. And then you're yeah. like, well, what happened? You know, because you're still yeah. in the job and you're 50 or whatever. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, blowing smoke up your ass a little bit. But you must have been thinking about this 10 years ago, maybe like, well, I'll tell you what, I need to, I need to start thinking a bit, a little bit sharper about this. I've always been motivated to train. Like in my younger years, I did powerlifting, then uh, briefly did some Olympic weightlifting. And so I've always enjoyed the training of weights. So I've maintained quite a good level of strength over the years. Never been one that was terribly fit. You know, I've tried running, I've tried aerobic type activities. And while I improve, I've just, you know, obviously I'm, I'm meant for strength, not for endurance. But, uh, <laughs> but I try to, I've tried to overlap with those. And I think consistency is a big thing i've really yeah. trained all my life and <laughs> no one here as frequently as I, as I should be but i suppose i try to get in do some weights um three to four times a week mm. i try to do some you know walk a couple of kilometers two or three times a week and i think consistency is a big thing pete you, you yeah. can't at any stage say you can't rest on the fitness level you had even months ago, if you don't do something mm. to maintain your strength and to maintain your fitness, you lose it very rapidly. So these days, it's uh, the... they're very short workouts, but they are consistent. Yeah, yeah, it's just consistency. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said to them, it was what's normal my phrase, it's something I heard many, many years ago. I was saying, you know, don't be good, be the enemy of great. Don't let, you know, just because the per- wasn't the perfect workout, just because you weren't feeling incredible, don't let that stop yeah. you from just getting in there and getting it done. You know, you just got to keep exactly showing right. up. Um, and I often think about that with a podcast. You know, I, I always call it learning out loud. I fumble through some of these conversations. I speak with people like yourself who are far more knowledgeable than yeah. me. And I'm like, I know I'm not going to get it right. You know, I'm not going to know as much as these people. It's not going to be perfect. I'm going to interrupt. We're going to stumble. I'm going to, you know, but that's life. Do you know what I mean? And this is yeah, why I think these right. conversations are so important. It's not got to be perfect. It's about your intention. Mm. So when it comes to fitness, yeah. your intention is a lot. I'm just trying to stay fit and healthy. I'm just trying to do the best I can with what I've got. It's not going to be mm. perfect. Mm. And I suppose that kind of brings me to the the whole analogy of instructing and learning and stuff like that. But I didn't want to um, move on before mm. I asked you about like, what is the expectations of firefighters in Brisbane these days? What's the sort of age ranges? When are people expected to work till? And, and what are they expected to do operationally in their 50s? Well, really, they're actually increasing the retirement age in Australia. I mean, I can go, I could have gone at 59 and picked up my full pension, but would have had to pay tax on it. So at 60 was the magic number for most of us. Okay. Uh, but 65 is, is a mandatory age. You have to retire at 65. But they're talking about they're pushing it up to 67. Wow. And there's no, yeah, it's crazy when you think about it. And there's no special allowances the firefighters and they're not really taking that into account so if you're 63 or 64 or you, or you want to go to the wire at 65 then you're either going to be operational or you're going to look for a you know day work position or a position where you're in a senior management role mm-hmm. and not everybody aspires to that for starters no yeah there's only so many day work positions so you know it's an issue uh, i know it's... when i first joined it was a bit of a People used to try and carve out positions on crews, on watches, where the old hand or the old sweat would mostly just drive. But in this day and age, we can't really get away with doing that. So, But I do kind of understand, just to flip that side of the coin from the government's perspective, everybody is living older now. We are living longer. Um, And, you know, it's the idea of having to pay people's pensions for 20, 25 years or something like that. But I do think firefighting sits in a very funny, little, strange little spot whereby you know, the realistic expectations of the job and how many people are going to be able to deliver that. So this is why, you know, certainly for myself, I've shifted a lot of my training, a lot of my lifestyles, a lot of my habits because you've really got to start stretching out that mindset. You can't you can't just chop and change the body, you know, in your 40s or your 50s if you fucked it up. And this is something that I really love and I want to be able to do it um, for, for that length of time. But when you look across the service and your colleagues and stuff like that, is the appetite that... 
that this is a this is a good thing is there any concerns about people's health or are people happy to keep doing it because actually the fire service is one of those strange things i mean you alluded to it in what you're going to be doing after you've retired it's one of those sectors that even though when people retire a lot tend to stick around anyway do you know what i mean and i don't think you find that with a lot of other jobs i think that's a good reflection of how passionate people are about this as a as a thing that they do for their career I wanted to jump in and just speak to you about a real ugly truth that despite the fact we are trying so hard, we get way too many messages and emails about mental well-being and mental health. And I recently came across something I think is going to be a real game changer. It's called Genesis. Now, this is really different because it's actually human-led mental and social well-being. It's not just an app somewhere that no one's ever going to use. They provide human-led regular bite-sized approaches. I'm talking 15 minutes at a time using language in a structured learning approach to create safe spaces for teams to have these conversations. And they've got a whole bunch of free workshops coming up online. First one is the 23rd of February, and it's built around sleep and performance with Dr. Martin Jones as a human performance and sleep specialist. You can find all this in the link to the podcast. Another thing I'd specifically say looking at is their 90-day program, which has been designed exclusively for well-being leaders in the police and fire and rescue sectors. It actually gives you some tangible tools to have these structured conversations so we can genuinely start to reduce burnout, absenteeism, and general poor mental health. It's not just a tick box, guys. So scroll down, have a look in the notes to this podcast. The first one is on the 23rd of February. I'm going to be there. And the reason I'm actually going to attend something like this versus other stuff is because it's human-led. It's actually going to be real people talking in a way that I can relate to and it's easy to implement with my team. So hopefully I'll see you there. Yeah, look, I think we take it in stride. Most of the guys, uh, you know, over their 60s, and the ladies too, uh, over their 60s are, are able to, you know, pace themselves. And generally, it, there's a mixture of crews. You don't get people all the same age. The guys tend to take care of themselves really well. Uh, you know, there's a few exceptions where, you know, you really need to put them driving the pump and you know, not get them involved in the pointy end of things. But surprisingly enough, most people are able to cope mm. in their early 60s. So you joined back in 83. Just give us a little bit of an understanding yes. of, because I, cause I want to go into sort of what, what happened when you started, the early startings of your career, and then some of the big incidents around, you know, 94, 96 that really changed your perspective. But but what was it like when you joined? What would basic training have been like? And how, how did the fire service look in the 80s back in Brisbane? Yeah, well, I was very military, actually, looking back. I used to be a greenkeeper. I was working on, on bowling greens and I'd been doing that for a couple of years and I had a, a nice club that I was working at and I was quite happy there. And being a greenkeeper, it's rather solitary. It's just yourself and your assistant. Yeah. You get the greens ready and, you know, you're outside all the time. And I was basically my own boss. And then I decided to join the fire service and I, I joined and I think it was around about week three, we're doing drills in the yard and it's repetitious up and down, your dry hose, dragging this, dragging that, people yelling at you, whistles blowing. <laughs> I'm thinking, what have I done? <laughs> you know, I've gone from one extreme to the other. And I, I must admit, the first couple of weeks, I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, what have I done? But I, I think by the third week, I said, no, look, I do like this and it's going to be my profession and I'm going to do it for the rest of my career. So, did you know I, anybody already in the well. job? What was what was the motivation to even join? Well, I didn't really know anybody, but I did know the deputy chief <laughs> of, the, okay. of the Brisbane Fire Brigade back there, which is always a, a big help. And uh, yeah. Don Christensen, Prickle, we used to call him. He was uh, an avid lawn bowler. So uh, I met Don through my greenkeeping, and you know, I was quite well respected by him, and it was mutual. And you know, I. A couple of my friends had, had spoken about the fire service and what a good job it is, and et cetera, et cetera. And I got talking to Don about it, and he said, Well, there's an intake coming up soon. You should you know, put in for it. So I applied and was successful, and yeah, I never looked back. It's been a fantastic career. No How long was whatsoever. the full intake that, that been there? What, what was the training like? Oh, you know, was it 12, 18 weeks? And what sort of stuff did you cover? Well, back then, it was 12 weeks. And I was actually the first crew not to be trained in the Bailey ladder, oh. uh, which which took two weeks off. Remember the old wheel escapes, the Bailey ladder? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a real skill to operate in those. So I was the first group that didn't do that. That took two weeks off our recruit training. But the first six weeks were dragging dry hose. 
We drag dry hose backwards and forwards, doing all these case drills and burning equipment before we even actually put water through the hose. Uh, whereas today, we, we get you know, start using water a lot earlier on in the piece, but, but the idea was to get you thinking along the way of those drills so each person knew their respective roles, mm. like the back of your hand before you started adding other elements of complexity. But very, uh, you know, rather quite strict and military and uh, demanding. It was full on. And, you know, you were a nobody back then. And even when you came up on shift, there was the senior hands table. You didn't dare sit there because you had really? you know, the right to sit there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's gone now. I tell you, it's, yeah. it's a very different different job. But there was a pecking order and you know, and in some ways it was good. Yeah, there was respect for the senior firefighters. They, they had um, been there for many years, of course, and ha- and had certain privileges. But it was yeah, pretty much a, a rank based thing. There was quite a division between the firefighter ranks and the officer ranks. Mm. They tended to be more divided then, but but certainly that that's changed now. It's uh, it's all homogenous. What was really the first, now. Uh... that sort of station that you joined on where was the first place that you worked and sort of how what the size of the the teams and the watches over there just so could people get an understanding because there is a bit of variation across uh, different countries about sizes of stations and, and layouts of services yeah well, that's an important question because when i joined the expectation was that the recruits would go to kemp place or Ram street they were the two headquarter stations both in the city and we had relatively large crews so we'd have one officer and five firefighters Okay. So one and three were the experienced senior hands. And as a junior firefighter, you, you fulfilled role two or role four. So it was on the job training. And you would be turning out with these characters. But you'd be going to real fires and you'd be backing them up. So, you know, they would grab you by the scruff of the neck and say, you're coming in with me. Or sometimes they do the <laughs> opposite. Say, no, you're not going in there. Come back in. That'd be stupid. So you had this on-the-job training. And mm. it, they were busy. There was really busy stations. And, and during the the, oh, the early 80s, right to the mid-80s, we're getting lots of fires. We've got a lot of opportunity to to practice the trade of structural firefighting. At around about probably the late 80s, they restructured because what we'd had was had these big crews in the headquarters stations and you'd have two pumps and a flyer you you know you'd have about 25 people who could roll out of each station in the headquarters there but you get to the out stations and theoretically the crewing was one officer and three firefighters but quite often there's someone if someone was sick they wouldn't replace them so a lot of the stations were running with one and two wow and so they said yeah, even back then because really... we do see that a little bit in yeah. certain places now when people hear that and they're like it would always used to be a minimum crew in a five Ooh. when i joined yeah well then that that all changed and the, the positive was that we got one and three for, for a while uh when we decentralized and we sent all, you know the younger guys out uh to the out stations mm. it took away that apprenticeship that was the negative side of things okay. and you've got people that have done their recruit training and gone, you know, straight from that very regimented military type, highly disciplined uh, period into the outstation life. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a contrast. So that's that's a negative side of it. And we had some numerous industrial battles over over time. And oh, I think it was probably not till the mid nineties that we really had a firm policy on uh, one and three being minimum crewing. And that meant that they, they had to then, if it dropped down to one and two, they'd have to recall somebody, uh, mm. do overtime, whatever had to be done to maintain their crewing. So obviously that's an expensive proposition, but it wasn't yeah. until the mid-90s we won that battle. And it's very, very rare these days to go below one and three, but that's the crew size uh, right through all the stations. Even headquarters is still just one and three. So back then, what was the considerations around like this? A bit like might sound like a boring question, but safe systems of work around things like structural firefighting. I mean, it's it's ultimately one of the most dangerous things that we do, with the exception of things like rope rescue and stuff like that. Structural firefighting is where you really need to have a safe system of work around you in terms of pump operators, incident mm. command, you know, entry control officers, things like that. What was the expectations mm. of those crews that were riding just three and their capability? 
um, to do certain systems of work when they arrived at incidents? In the early stages, it was very unstructured. You'd arrive at a job, uh, the first pump would start operating from the front of the structure, the second pump would roll up the opposite, would say, oh, gee, I think we probably need to have a line on the on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. So as each crew arrived, they all did their own thing. They, it's like okay. Lego blocks, they built onto what was done before and sometimes it worked out all right. Um, sometimes it was a disaster. So there was no clear incident command structure at that oh, point really? in time. Mm. If now, I was towards the end of that real firefighters, the real bomb and don't wear BA era. And it was just, just starting to become aware of the fact that a lot of our colleagues were, you know, getting to retirement age, uh, you know, turned 60 and, and two years later were going to their funeral. They've died of cancer. So we were starting to put two and two together very slowly mm-hmm. and realising that this wasn't a very healthy thing to be not wearing breathing apparatus. And did they have? Then, set, sorry to interrupt. Did they have sets on all the rigs though? Did they? They did have. Did they have a couple of sets or four sets? Well, well, that's that's a good point because when I came in, uh, I wasn't actually trained in breathing apparatus. That three months was just your basic uh, firemanship type skills. Okay. And then you had another three months probation. Your name was still in pencil by then. They, they wouldn't say that. You know, they said you've just got to behave yourself for the next three months, and then you do the BA training. Okay. Well, the problem with that is, well, well, you can imagine what the problem with that is. And very early on in my career, I ended up at a major fire, a chemical fire, Chem Air it was called, and um, big uh, joint with a lot of agricultural chemicals in there. And I recognised some of the chemicals from my green keeping days. And, uh, you know, it would use fungicides and herbicides and insecticides yeah. and, you know, like parathion is one of those ones, a couple of drops in a glass of water will kill you. And I was recognising all these toxic chemicals around and I wasn't allowed to wear breathing apparatus. So consequently, you know, I got sick and I was, I was living on bananas and wheat mix for about three or four weeks. I got ulceration through started my lips went through my gums my throat i was really sick i, I believe i got mercury poisoning you know, oh. from from that particular job so that took me about three or four months to recover from that and then i was allowed to do my breathing apparatus training well it's, that's changed now so that is part of the recruit course when mm. they came out that i was really qualified to be a breathing apparatus but back then i think it was pretty common to only have two sets on the truck anyway Wow. It was a couple of years later before we actually got four BA sets on, on the appliance. And some of the older station officers were a little bit funny about wearing, letting you wear a breathing apparatus. I can remember uh, one chap, I won't mention his name, he's still in psycho, obviously for obvious reasons. <laughs> go to, it was if the job be going nice and he'd roll up and he'd go psycho and start waving his arms about and screaming. <laughs> Love it. Um, we were, we'd been in this job. I just put this, I think I was wearing my second set. I'd just gone inside, taken about a dozen breaths, and he, his psychos run inside the building. Wait, they take them off, take them off. You don't need them now. And he, he'd run into the middle of this building. And the smoke oh, wasn't yeah. super thick, but it was it was dirty. It was filthy, putrid smoke. Yeah. He's gone 50 metres inside the building to tell me and my colleague to get outside and get those things off. You don't need them anymore. It is possible to breathe in there. So what that was, the was that to old them? generation. Were they, were they just expensive to refill or people thought it was a ball no. ache? Just if you used them, you'd have to clean them and, and make them up again or what? It was No, it was a macho thing. It was the mark of a good firefighter was how much smoke you could eat. Wow. And the guys that were, were admired the most get to be you know number one on the branch were guys that were able to take a lot of punishment, go inside and suck up smoke, and, and that were held in very high esteem. Now, by 83, 84, a lot of those guys were dying young when they you know, just get out of retirement. A year or two later, they're dead. So we were gradually starting to work out that that's probably not the way to go for the future, but there was a, still a bit of a, a carryover uh, from those days. And, yeah, I mean, it's insane, isn't it? I just put the set on. I don't even breathing it for a couple of minutes. Get them off. You don't need those. Get them off. So yeah. then we went and um, and then really even overhaul. Now we don't even go inside if it's even when there's no smoke. If we're overhauling, we'll put a set on. Yeah. So we had I was exposed to to a little bit of that uh, during that era, but uh, we we gradually got there. A bit slow to learn, aren't we? We tend mm. to learn the hard way in the fire service. 
So when you did actually go and do your initial uh, breathing apparatus training, your, your structural firefighter training, what did it entail? Because I know, you know, when, when we get onto it, we'll talk about the big arc of learning that you went through and some mm. of the unfortunate incidents that you attended. But back then, what was the interpretation of, um, you know, what was expected when people would put on BA, that they, they would take a line in? What sort of training did you go through for your BA and how long would it have been? It was pretty arduous because uh, we were recruits and we were new to the job. It was once again like boot camp all over again. And I think it was a two-week course. And uh, I think the last three or four days, we were actually wearing the Proto Mark V, the regenerative oxygen sets. Okay. There was three or four days of that as well. And we had a... What was in the long duration ones involved. that people used to use in the mines and stuff, the regenerative ones with the crystals mm. in that used to, used to be able to wear for long duration. <laughs> the, those ones. <laughs> the Proho Mark V, I think it dates back to the 1950s. A, a funny story. Um, I'd done a refresher. They'd taken them out of mothballs. They bought all the old Protos from around Australia. And they, I think I did a refresher in about... 94 was the last crew to do a refresher and i went over to happened to be in london and, went, and i dropped in the london fire brigade museum there and this guy showing me around said, oh, yes, it's a proto mark five and i said yeah i did a refresher on those about a month ago <laughs> <laughs> and the look he gave me like <laughs> i don't think he believed me and it was sitting at the museum and i said when, when did you do commission i said oh, about 20 years ago okay, uh, so uh, but but yeah so um so, and then the last exercise was a do or die, and it was it was very arduous, and it was meant to sort the men from the boys. They put you in the ship, so they fill it full of smoke and heat as well, very hot conditions. And if you've never worn a rebreather, they're they're really hard to wear them because after a while, you you know all the carbon dioxide's yeah being taken out by the absorbent, the your metabolic heat's building up, and you're inhaling this hot. Oxygen. Yeah, I and wore one for uh, a mines uh, rescue uh, training course about twelve uh, years ago, and it was very, very different, very surreal, and quite just quite an uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, like you said, it was quite uncomfortable to breathe because it progressively yeah. just get, it starts to warm up towards the hotter, end of the wear, hotter. and it, it was yeah. it was weird. I didn't like it to be honest. It's it's exhausting, just even even sitting down and just breathing that that hot. Air, well, not air, it's oxygen. Breathing that hot oxygen through is in itself exhausting. So that was a real do or die. And people, you know, be down to the wire. They're just about be fainting and passing out. And but, but, you, real, you man. real man, real <laughs> man. You get, you get scrubbed. Okay. <laughs> you get scrubbed. All, you know, you get Jeez. sacked. So uh, it was pretty arduous back then. So what was the actual like fire behaviour aspect of it? When we think about reading the fire well, in the situations and, and understanding. Uh, you know, mechanics and air, airflow and pathways and stuff like that. Was there anything into that, or where was their level of knowledge of those nothing. sort of uh, those conditions? Absolutely nothing. Our <laughs> live fire training back then consisted of a visit to the Ampol refinery, where they would light up a couple of petrochemical uh, fires, and we'd light up and light back, and that was live fire training. And you usually that the recruits would do it. If you're lucky, you might get a chance once or twice in your career over the next 10 years to, to do it as well. So there was virtually no live fire training at all. Um, I think around about 92, 93, we had our academy and we had a we had a couple of props, external props. There was a car, an LPG bullet, um, yeah, a couple of really simple external mm. gas-fired props. And, and that was live fire training. Mm. And... I, I cut my teeth on the British manuals of firemanship. They, mm -hmm. they were our textbooks. And, uh, and I, I still think they're a, they're a fantastic textbook. Uh, obviously a little bit out of date now. But uh, so we based very British. So all of the systems that we used were based off that, that British system. It was a very good system. That's pretty but much a global approach. That. But that also makes me quite sad mm -hmm. because I don't think we've made, and this is going to be really harsh, I don't, we have made lots of steps forward, but we seem to have rested on our laurels a little bit. When I look at the global landscape of mm. certainly fire behavior training and, and, and other aspects of the sector, oh. but sorry, I interrupted you, but yeah, like that is where yeah. a lot of the origins of a lot of global fire services came from, but I don't know if it was yeah. a bit of our ego or a bit of our elitism. I don't know. I try to understand the more I speak to different people, but 
yeah, it came from there, but then it feels like yourselves and the Swedish and, and I mean, the French are doing some incredible things seem to have taken some much more significant strides forward since then. Yeah, well, we ended up developing our own curriculum. And as part of, you know, when I did my study tour in the UK and Sweden, 97, I had to review the, the curriculum. I think there was two paragraphs, a paragraph for flash error and a paragraph for backdraft. And whoever written them got, them, got the definitions mixed up. <laughs> That's, okay. that's how bad it was. That's how bad it was. Uh, but look, the UK were doing some fantastic things in the, uh, particularly in the mid to late nineties. So really, some phenomenal work coming out of there. And it really, it all goes back to Krista Gieselson in in Sweden in, in the mid nineteen seventies, because he was one of the few people that would look at things and say, well. Why are we doing this? And, and he, he went basically went through their materials and said, it's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. <laughs> and, and he actually rewrote the whole thing. Uh, and that, that itself is a fascinating story. I could talk for hours about how they developed uh, their, their process and you know, what, what a terrible price Krista paid for, for being a revolutionary. But by the mid-80s... That's often the case, though, isn't it, with so many things. Like, oh, they say... Yeah. A lot of um, a lot of behaviors or a lot of uh, processes progress at the rate of funerals, is what I heard a long time ago. And they say that yeah, with science sometimes. It's only when that person yep. retires or dies that yes. some people actually let go of those beliefs, and they have the they have the sort of fortitude and assertiveness to go. Fucking hell! I've not. I can't remember why we were doing that for so long, but he's gone now. So let's let's actually you know bring things up to speed. It's a funny story with Krista. Uh, and that's uh, Rosanda tells a story how they've um, Krista's been getting in trouble at the, the National Academy there because he's teaching stuff that's not in their curriculum, and so he's he's in the bad books anyway. And Krista was a very down the line guy. He'd tell you exactly what he thought. If you asked him, he'd tell you. So apparently, the the new commandant there he he'd written a book on firefighting, and uh, they're doing a bit of a morning session there, a toolbox talk, and uh, pass the book around and. So what do you think of it? Oh, yeah, it's a pretty good boss. You're a pretty good chief, you know. And they hmm. all going around, and Krista said nothing. And he said, Krista, what do you think about it? He says, well, there are two things about this book that's correct. The date it was written and the name of the author. The rest is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. So that's Krista. <laughs> love him. Got to love it. <laughs> So it, yeah, was, so it was. It would have, it would have oh been the early nineties, wouldn't it? I was just trying. I'm just trying to think because you'd have been in for around ten years then, and it was around that period where you probably started finding your feet and growing in your confidence. But I wanted to try and visit um, before I forget about it. Those two kind of incidents that really lit a fire under your conviction to try and learn a little bit more about this. If you could take us back to to ninety four, I've seen I've seen you write about it before. I've read a couple of articles around some of the tragic incidents that you attended. And if you could talk us through what happened and why that, you know, viscerally um, sort of made you want to go off and, and, and have this big adventure and, you know, become an instructor yourself. Well, I think by that stage, I'd been starting to question. There was, a, there was a void in our training. And for the previous four years from 89, actually for most of my career, I was looking outside for those answers to those questions. And, you know, go to a fire and uh, we'd come back and something weird's happened. I'd, or I'd say to you know, one of the fires, yeah, what just happened then? He said, oh, it was this, it was that. I'd ask somebody else and they'd say something different. Man, it just really, it was quite clear. We didn't really know that was happening. We were experiencing these events. We couldn't predict them. We couldn't name them. And we were, we were getting all these close calls. So 1994, there was a fire in a Honda dealership in Southport, just south of Brisbane. It wasn't a particularly large building. If you see the building, it's probably only about, I don't know, lucky if it's 20 metres by 15 metres. It had mm -hmm. a, a bit of a basement area there. And there was a fire in there. And it must have been deep-seated, you can imagine, with parts and rubble and, you know, concealed fire. So the, there's two firefighters in there. There is some flare-up of the fire that's observed. And the guys have been missed. They've sent an, another crew in to find them. And they have also been caught in a fire event. And they got there was almost two more people killed at that particular fire. Mm. So there's these two 
some events and two of our colleagues died. Herbie Fennell and Noel Watson, uh, we lost them in that fire. And that was 94. And so everyone's asking yourself, why? Why did this happen? And people had different ideas and different theories. And so on. we'll wait to see what the coroner says. Initially takes about two years before the coroner finishes the investigation and they've got unlimited time frames. They can call experts from anywhere and everywhere. So we waited very patiently for the coroner's report to come out. And when I read it, I was so disappointed. Uh, the coroner talks of uh, some phenomenon of fire, which uh, would have produced uh, enough heat to uh, burn these guys to the point where they became rendered unconscious. But he couldn't name the phenomenon of fire. He couldn't say whether that's what killed them. And I thought, this is dreadful. I mean, in the whole of the country, there's nobody that, that can come up and say, well, what happened was this, 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 and that's what killed yeah. them. There was nobody could actually do that. And I thought, that's appalling. It's not good enough for two people to die mm. and not have not exactly what that phenomenon, some phenomenon of fire was. So that really fired me up. And Do you think there was just I'd a romantic some... aspect of people thinking, look, Shan, it's just a dangerous job. This is the this is just yeah. what we do, and that's the cost yeah. we have to pay sometimes. Because there can be a romantic aspect yeah. to that when people like to yeah. believe that you know, we're never going to understand it, you know, the, the, the big red beast, blah, 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 and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, look, there's, there's definitely an element of that. Uh, but it, a lot of it's just ignorance. And there, there were some things that went wrong at, the, at that fire. And, and if you look at any fatal fire, there's the three big, you know, communic command, control, communications, mm. uh, all issues with those. And we got thermal imaging cameras out of it. And we got uh, each firefighter had a radio. So we tightened up on our BA control procedures. So there was, there was half a dozen things that came out of that that were positive. And I thought, that's great, but that's not the key issue. The key, you know, the reason these things fail was because of this event. And if we, if we can't prevent more of those events, mm. these other things aren't going to save people. So that really had me fired up. So for this time, I'm putting together a bit of a plan. I, I read about the Swedes and what they were doing. I actually made contact with a fellow called John Taylor, who was a real true pioneer in the UK in the early 90s. John did some fantastic work. He was a great mentor. And he helped me put together some plans for, to learn more about this. So I've been I've been talking about this uh, from you know since '94. '96 comes along when there's another event. This time in a, in a backpackers hostel in Rockhampton, which is it's six seven hours north of Brisbane. It's a fairly rural small you know, small town there. So what's happened this time around is there's two firefighters searching a part of the hostel that's not involved in fire. So part of it is involved in fire. This part's not, so they're just clearing each room. So they've gone down a corridor and doing a progressive search as they go through. So what they said is that before the event that hit them, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. So the conditions, it wasn't particularly hot. There was light grey smoke there, but really nothing. It could have been, you know, wearing a T-shirt and a pair of shorts. Okay. And then suddenly this event has occurred. And actually, I spoke to, to one of the, the, the guys. that Both survived. One went back to work, one didn't. The guy went back to work. He said it was like a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It was three waves that hit them. Now, this particular chap, he was on his knees at the time. And he turned around and crawled back out. And when he got outside, the webbing on his BA had melted. Uh, the visor when the helmet's melted, the, the helmet's paralyzing, his coat's paralyzing, he's burnt. He's in a mess. <clears throat> he turns around, his colleague's not there. So you know what he does? <laughs> he turns around and goes back in. I mean, that's just the most amazing thing. And in, in the condition he was in, he would have had every right to say, hey, somebody else go in there, get my colleague out. So he's gone inside the chap that, didn't come out initially was standing so he, he copped a, a higher intensity blast yeah there's a photo that shows a dent he, he was blown to the side of the hallway put a dent in the plaster with his helmet 
and then fell into one of the rooms. This guy's gone in, grabbed him, dragged him outside. But I'm thinking, my oh, you know, it's just so close. It's almost two more firefighters killed. Yeah. Now, by this time, by this stage, there was a documentary called Under Fire. Have you ever seen it? I have not seen it, but I'm going to make a note of it now. You've got to see it. You've got to see it. It's uh, made by Discovery Channel. And this had aired, and it, it had gone right around the world. And it had aired in Brisbane in probably the early, about 96. And a lot of people had seen that. And it was actually Jordan Taylor featured in, in the documentary. So basically <laughs> okay. what this film crew have done is they've they've gone to Sweden. They've looked at uh, what Chris has been doing there. They interviewed Nisa Bergstrom. Uh, they, they did all this expose on, on fire behaviour and development and the way it's been done in Sweden and then compared it to the UK. And it was, you know, actually a lot of people were very embarrassed about it, but it was a real catalyst for change. I think that was produced around about 94, 95. Yeah. And it did drive a lot of positive change in the UK. So by this stage, <clears throat> that's that's been out. A lot, and it's had a lot of, it really opened people's eyes. It's a, it's a great documentary thing to have a look at it, to the need for us to, to change and to, to do things differently. So... You know, with two fatalities, two near misses, by that stage, I was ready to put forward a proposal. And it was good timing. We'd um, gone through a number of reviews, as you do on the fire service, every five or six years. And the organisation had changed to an authority. So it was the Queensland Fire and Rescue Authority. The new chief wanted to be seen to be progressive. So uh, as a result of that, I ended up uh, getting approved in 1997 I went over to Sweden and the UK and looked at how, you know, they'd be managing that change um, over the previous decade. So when you first started making those troubles, was this connections you were making through through email? Were you just calling people up? Because, you know, at this stage, you just still, were you still just a firefighter or what, what rank would you have been? Or was it common practice for people to go and take these these sort of uh, leaves of absence to, 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 you know, bring knowledge back to the service? Well, I was just a grubby subby. You know, we had substation officers and station officers. Um, I'd been a substation officer for a number of years and had no aspirations of even becoming a station officer. I was happy being a grubby subby. Uh, so, yeah. It's it still that. Really you know, that's and, another step in your, in your career. Well, w- when was the first inkling that you wanted to progress into that? Because you're only, you know, eight, nine years into your career here. Yeah. So, I actually, when I came back from Sweden, I think around about uh, 99 there was things that were changing. The structure was changing. I thought, I suppose I should move up to station officer rank. So I did that, um, I think it was a subby for about 10 years before I went up to station officer rank. Hmm. I, I preferred the subby rank because you could actually get more hands-on. Okay. Back then, the station officers were expected to stay outside, whereas the subbies could go in with their crew and you know get dirty, get hands-on. And, and that's something I've always loved. And the role changed a little bit. So it, it I could see that by becoming a station officer, I wouldn't be stuck outside with a clipboard. I was, I was able to go in. So that was uh, impetus for me to mm. to move forward to, to that rank. But that's, that's as high as I ever aspired to. Uh, but, uh, it's but, you interesting know, you talk that a about... lot of people didn't mm. want to progress to the higher echelons because people will hear and they'll look at your story and stuff like that and they'll think, wow, perfect, you know, chief officer material. But it's always interesting to see um, how far away from the coalface people want to get and what their drivers are. Because you retired at uh, yeah. station officer, isn't it? Mm, yes. Yeah, dizzy, dizzy rank of station officer. <laughs> no, mate, 100%. Uh, that's probably where I think I'll end up. You know, people keep encouraging me to go for my station officers now, but I just think it's it's too early on in my career and I don't want to stop yeah. doing the instructing side of stuff because once you become yeah. a station officer over here, there's, you no longer be able to 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 be an instructor. I currently work in our training department, and it's it's I'm absolutely loving it. It's it's such an incredible well, experience exactly to be able to have yeah, people. That's the same for me, Pete. You know, it was yeah. my that was my motivation. You know, I, I wanted to stay at the point end and operational, and that's why I held off for so long uh, before I became a station officer. Only when the the role changed and it allowed that that more flexibility, mm. that I moved forward. So I hear you, and I, and I commend you for it. I think you've got to be. You've got to be where, you, where you're happy. And I know I've got some colleagues, many colleagues that have retired as senior firefighters, bright people who could have been anything they wanted to be, but they were happy at that role. Yeah. And, and happy to stay operational. So power to them. 
Hey folks, just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being. Whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests, if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services, we get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one-size-fits-all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me. And I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming. Absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. So talk to me about those first stepping outside of the service. Obviously, you'd, you'd seen this documentary. You'd made contact with a few people. When was the first time you traveled? Was it Sweden? Was it the UK? What did you see? And what were the first sort of big realizations that things were things were very different in other areas of the world? Well, at that stage, you know, the internet was relatively new. And you know, making an overseas phone call was a big deal. You had to have a special you know, line and it was expensive and internet relay chat was the, was the closest thing you'd get to communication. So it was really in the early, early stages of that IT revolution. So a lot of it revolved around, you know, magazines, buying books, reading books. And I had a the librarian, we had a fantastic library and the librarian always kept me in mind. And um, she'd send me these articles um, out of the blue, she said, oh, I thought you might be interested in this. So that was how I sort of got a lot of my connections and a lot of my little information. But so the, the study tour primarily was about firstly going to Sweden to see the origins, mm. to look at how it had developed. And I got to meet Krista Gieselson and uh, later on, uh, years later, before I, I did, until I met Nils and um, I Nisa and um, Matt Rosander. But I had a, you know, spoke with the original people, and they were just fantastic to me. I was hosted by Uppsala Fire Service. They had a fantastic training centre there. I spent two weeks there, and then they really opened doors for me right throughout um, Sweden. And I did um, Jarfella, Stockholm, uh, Rosersburg, all all the key centres at the time. And then I thought, well, that's great. That's the Swedish culture is a real can-do culture. The Australian culture is very much like the British culture. We're really safety focused and slow and steady. We love the documentation and rah rah rah. <laughs> so I thought, well, I need to, I need to go to the UK to look at how, how it's being, how it's being adopted into the UK. And you know, you know what I found in Sweden, it was sort of like almost passed down from father to son. It was there wasn't okay. a lot of high quality written material back then. And, you know, we just, that's just not part of our culture. If we're going to teach something, we've got to have a manual and we've got to have mm. a PowerPoint. Kind of was process. there any big differences so in there, in their operational approach, though, that you saw when you were over in Sweden in, in the way that either they, they utilized the equipment or the, the tactics or, or techniques that they used? Well, yeah, there, there, there were some really big differences. Not, I suppose not massive I mean, if you're comparing sweden to the us massive differences because the exact opposite ventilation philosophy is employed in the us it's very much open up and things get better yeah isn't always the case uh, in sweden it was like keep everything closed and things will stay good so somewhere in between is, is reality but uh so yeah they were very they'd really adopted the teachings of of krista and uh matt's rosanda and, and nisa so that was um they're very, very disciplined, um, very impressive for our service. They worked with a, what they call it? A, oh, it was a three-person team. I'm trying to think of the name of the team. And they had a BA commander and their two firefighters. So basically what they do, they take their BA control to the entry point. So the BA commander would, would be fully kitted up. He wouldn't actually have, he wouldn't be on air, but the mask would be on, on his um, uh, shoulder. Mm-hmm. And he would 
actually do BA control from right at that entry point. So really high level of supervision wow, okay. with the BA teams. That was one thing that stood out. The high risk procedure, they uh, how they secure their water supplies. They, they won't just take a line off a pump. They'll take a line off to a collector or church, they call it, and then they'll get an independent supply into that one there. So if this pump dies, the other one will kick in. And they're really, really thorough, uh, okay. the way they did their hose lays and their teamwork and the way they had high-risk procedures. So if they had to go a long way inside of a building, they'd have the team halfway through securing the line of retreat. So really, really interesting uh, strategies and tactics they, they were using back then. It's still, I think, still using those basic mm. practices now. So that was one of the things that stood out. But, you know, really the UK Fire Service was were doing some amazing things. Uh, by, by 95, 96, when I was there, it was really starting to accelerate. So John Taylor had been a real catalyst. He'd stirred up the pot, and as a result of that, uh, Richard Chitty and the Home Office did some research and they had to admit, yeah, okay, we're not we're not really where we could be. So that was a big admission. So he'd stirred up that and it was really, there was some great change occurring and they'd formed working groups probably in about 94 and look, by 98, some of the stuff they'd achieved was mind-blowing. Mm. They'd really leapfrogged and they'd taken that occupational health and safety approach uh, the documentation, um, you know, the, the manuals to it to a new level, and so by the late nineties, what they'd achieved in, in probably the, you know probably about a five or six years year period was just mind blowing. And then, yeah, the UK Fire Service seemed to go to a different track. Uh, yeah, late nineties, uh, there was massive change there, and austerity measures and cost cutting, and <clears throat> it's unrecognisable today from what it was back in the late 90s. Uh, really, mm. it's a very different service. Mm. John Taylor, did he author Smoke Burns? Yes, yes. Yes, I've just, I, yeah, I know he's, he's on my hit list. <laughs> I've, uh, I've got uh, John's down. an amazing guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. the name was, was screaming through my head when you were saying it there, and I've tried to, I'm going to make contact again with John. So yeah, for people that I really owe John, John a lot. Is, uh, yeah, he's an interesting yeah, he, guy. He so really he did a lot of the um, air track management mm. stuff, and he's got a website, yes. smokeburns.com, so people can go there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, John's left a real legacy there. Probably hasn't uh, received the recognition he deserves, because mm. uh, John's a little bit like Krista. He'll, if you ask him what he thinks, he'll tell you. <laughs> and um, not, not everybody can handle his, his directness and his honesty, but uh, some people love him for it's like uh, Krista. Some people loved him when they hated him because if you asked him a question, you get an honest answer. <laughs> and some people really, really admire that. Other people can't handle it. So, so John what was some... it like bringing those concepts back, you know, to, to Australia and, and really starting to get an understanding for concepts such as like we were alluding to earlier with those incidents, you know, flashovers and backdrafts. And how soon were you able to, was it a case of, trying to a little bit of copy and paste from some of the British stuff in terms of yes. documentation and trying to yes. structure those manual, those newer manuals of firemanship. Uh, was there much pushback around these new concepts and how was it adopted? Yeah, well, I was actually expecting a lot of pushback, but I think that the shock of losing two colleagues from in South Port Honda, the, the near misses in Rockhampton and that documentary, Under Fire, really had us questioning the way we, we were doing business. So I actually was received quite well. I didn't get a lot of pushback. There was actually very little pushback. Mostly people were, were open to the new ideas. Mostly, you know, that 90% I'd say were open to the new ideas. And so that, that part of it was, was quite good. But, you know, we had a long way to go. I mean, it was 97. And at that stage, they were going to put a bulldozer through our training center. They're going to build a new one. So I had a green field. We, we lease some land off the refinery there and basically they said there it is Shane there's the floor plan <laughs> dream <laughs> big so it was a great opportunity to be able to design a whole range of props from the really basic compartment to the multi-compartment to external props etc wow. etc et so yeah it was a very very busy time three years uh, of uh, very, very intense I think I, I burnt myself out you know towards the end of it but because mm. it was an opportunity, I could see there's an opportunity to make change. There were, we had the right people in, in place, and I could see that window was closing. The, the 
there'd been a political change and uh, the, mm. the size of Everest was being restructured. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to get as much done in that time frame as I could. But it was a, it was a really amazing time looking back. Uh, I don't think I could do it again. But uh, and we in well, the, I think the best part was 1999. So I got my Swedish instructor Tommy Tawney. He was my mentor in in Sweden um, during the initial study. I got him over for a year. I managed to secure a secondment of a Swedish wow. fire engineer for a year. And so Tommy and I uh, worked very closely together. Uh, and he just looked at the depth of knowledge of these guys. I mean, he, he can handle a nozzle like a, you know, like a first-class firefighter, mm. yet has a depth of knowledge about science. And he taught me so much, uh, gave me such a, a depth of knowledge in, in the science behind all of the, the practical stuff. So that time I spent with Tommy uh, was just an incredible learning experience. Mm. So great times. So do you move fully into the training department by this time? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. When I was on the plane flying over to Sweden, I think, what have I done? But I couldn't believe it. we'd got to the point where it had been approved. Here I am on a plane and think, I've just signed my life away. I'm never going to go back on shift again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be yes, stuck yeah. in training for the rest of my life. I'm going to owe them for the rest of my <laughs> life. And, um, but anyway, like after three years, I th- I look, I just I burnt myself out. Um, the political climate had changed. It was a new regime. Mm. I'm thinking, oh, I've had enough of this. I've, you know, I've go, I'll go back operational. And I so, say, you know, for the next 22 years, I, I spent most of my career just as a station officer on shift. Did a couple of projects uh, in between the tunnels and Churchill Fellowship. But um, yeah, so we're, you know, I'm very proud of the the change I was able to make in those time frames. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's also very, it takes a toll on you as well. Mm. What's kept you so heavily involved in the, in the international side of it then? Because, you know, you're, you're a very respected speaker and people call for you to, you know, wade in and give your input on several things. And you've also written, you know, a couple of books. So, you know, I know you say that you just, you, you went back onto shift or you went back into that station officer role, but you've still clearly had an appetite to, to keep an involvement in a lot of the work that's been happening internationally? I've just been really blessed to have people around me, a handful of people that have believed in me and encouraged me. I think, you know, a couple of pivotal people, if they hadn't been in my life, well, I don't know where I'd be now. Jeffrey Van Kronenburg was a good friend of mine and he really encouraged me and he kept me going. And like 2000, I went back on shift and I was really, really washed out and burnt out and the politics and things was changing and it was a difficult time. So I was a little bit low, but Jeff kept encouraging me. And uh, by 2002, the, the, you know, the interest was still there as strong as ever. I was getting my mojo back. And also <clears throat> during that time, I was helping other fire services around Australia with their program. So they, they turned to me and say, Shan, you know, how can you, can you help us out? I mean, and John McDonough was one of those. So John mm. and I made contact, I think, um, early 2000. And uh, he used to pour his hat out to me on the phone with all the issues, all the politics. And uh, so I helped John. And before then was South Australian Fire Service. I kept in contact with them. Then I'd helped uh, Northern Territory. So I I sort of kept in contact with colleagues around Australia. That kept my momentum going. And then around about 2003, the South Australian colleagues wanted to do their own study tour, so you he helped me. I said, oh, yeah, sure. So I, I wrote up a study tour, mostly the UK, uh, Exeter and um, Cornwall and Devon and um, Northern wow. Marsh. And then Singapore on the way back and I uh, thought, oh, hang on, I might go along myself. So I self-funded. I paid for everything myself. So I went along with them for three or four weeks. So that, that reinvigorated my knowledge again. I was able to see the changes in the UK. <clears throat> And that was 2003. And then around about that time, Paul Wimwood and I were talking on a regular basis. And Paul said, I've got an idea for this book called 3D Firefighting. Would you be interested? I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. And we got talking about it. And I said, well, there's two other people you should involve. And one's my colleague from New South Wales, John McDonough. John's got a you know, real, really gifted with graphic art and um, mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. He's a natural presenter. And Ed Hart, who was a guy I've been in contact with, never met him, uh, battalion chief from the USA, but 
but really broadened his thinking and, mm. and, and hungry for knowledge. So anyway, so that, yeah, we linked up and um, I'd met John. I'd never met Paul. Um, none of us had met Ed. And we, over a period of about a year and a half, we wrote this book together. And never, never once met face to face during that whole process. It's all done really? by email correspondence. Yeah, wow. yeah. And I think the, f- the first time we were act- all four of us were together was in Belgium, only about six, seven years ago. <laughs> so it was Bloody bizarre. hell! But yeah, it was quite a, quite a feat looking back at it. But but that book was great for for all of us, and um, it was published in two thousand and five. <clears throat> I suppose that's when. That's when things really took off for me. It, it helped put me on the map, 3D firefighting. Uh, mm. It was controversial in the States. Uh, still controversial it's in some quarters. Uh, but How um, did you go about putting that together then? Was it just, did you have just a skeleton idea of all the areas you wanted to cover and you kind of split them amongst yourselves? Or mm. Because I've, I've certainly not written a book and I know it's a tremendous undertaking. Well, yeah, basically we, we sat down and said, what, what do we need? We want this to be a comprehensive manual. And and I think we tried to be all things to all people. And I think if you're going to write to instructors, you can't write to chiefs. If you're going to write to chiefs, you can't write to firefighters. We tried yeah. to do everything. And, and look, I think the book was it's been very well received and it's a good reference book and people still refer to it today. But yeah, we just broke it up into chunks and we all had our areas of, of passion and expertise and, and knowledge and we'd uh, write our chapters, then we'd throw it across to each other and we'd edit it and delete it and no, we won't. And this, sometimes we'd have, we'd have meetings and say, no, no, you can't use that. <laughs> so we, we had our little fights, not fights, but you know, <laughs> discussions about terminology and backwards and forwards. But yeah, eventually we'd all just all peer reviewed each other's chapters. And when we're all, we had to reach consensus. And when we'd reach consensus about one chapter, bang, that's one chapter done. Then the next one and the next one. So, and that was the process. And that was published in the States by Fire Protection Publications. And I think it came out in 2005. I was over in um, Germany for Interschutz in 2005, and that's when it was released. So, um, and really, just from then, people just asked me to do stuff, and it just grew from there. Every year, it got bigger and bigger. Um, it's South Africa with Paul, I think, in 2005, and I did quite a bit of work in Malaysia for the National Fire Service there. And you keep thinking, oh, well, I'll do it this year because next year there'll be nothing. But it, it just never stopped. And really? oh, towards the end, I think um, <clears throat> 2019 was a crossroads for me because I think I'd spent four months overseas. And I'm just thinking, I what can't keep doing this. I mean, How I'd, receptive um, was your I... service of having this much time off? Because like, there can, <laughs> there can be those aspects of people internally you know, feeling mm. jealous or you know, not... <laughs> You know, not very favourable about the fact that you were going away and, and doing well, some development yourself. It, w- it was the worst kept secret in the fire service, I think. Uh, it, because of that jealousy factor, um, I, I did, I didn't tell, I didn't talk about it a lot. No. Of course, you know, in the last ten years with Facebook, you can't go anywhere or do anything without someone posting yeah. a photo of you. But you know, the first gigs I did, I, I just took leave. I. I I got my annual leave and we get long service leave. So after 10 years, you get an extra 13 weeks. So I, uh, by 2019, I'd, I'd burnt 30, 30, nearly 40 years worth of long service leave. I had no yeah. long service leave. Now <laughs> annual leave, I was doing shift exchanges. And uh, so basically all of my leave time was, was spent overseas. And I was lucky towards the end there, was a change in the award, and you could actually take leave at half rate. So I was almost out of leave by 2015, and this the half rate came along. So oh, yeehaw! So for what a month off, and had had to burn two weeks leave. But then, of course, you only get two weeks pay. Yeah. So I sacrificed the money, uh, but that allowed me to to keep going. But yeah, from about 2015 to 19, it was I was averaging four months a year. Overseas in the previous years, I was averaging three months, so it was just a lot of time yeah. away from home. And and then by 2019, I think physically I can't do this again next year. Mm. So I was thinking of thinking of leaving in, in 2020 um, because it's so much work teed up. And then COVID came along, 
<laughs> so well, oh, decided yeah. to stay another 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 year or two. So, uh, and that was that was good. Again, it was actually pretty good. Twenty COVID was good to me in that regard because I think I was I was burning out. I was just doing so much around the place. But yeah, it's it's been a fantastic experience. It just so just when word you look of at mouth places and, like mm-hmm. Malaysia and, and South Africa, you know, having visited those parts of the world, you know, what were the some of the biggest differences you say there? Are they how much further ahead or behind the curve are they in terms of the way that they are, you know, equipped and the way that they're supported? Was there any big learnings that you took away from seeing the the wide spectrum of how different yeah. people operate across the world? That that's the wonderful thing, thing, thing Pete. It's just such a privilege to be able to look at how another country does the same job. And I, I say it's about 80, 20, 80% is pretty familiar, pretty much the same, mm-hmm. but 20% is like really different. <laughs> and that's the part that's really interesting. And then you get into the cultural differences. Um, and I did my first contract in Korea, Republic of Korea in, in um, 2015. Wow. And what a learning curve that was. I mean, because I'd worked in Malaysia, I, I got to understand that culture. I've worked in Thailand quite a bit. Um, mm. But then, so I'm thinking, oh, I know these Asian cultures, I'm all over this, you know. And the Korean culture is, is different again. Uh, so massive learning curve there. In the last couple of years, I've been working with colleagues in Japan. Uh, so it's just, I, I just love it. It's just fascinating to see that 20% difference in how we basically get the same job done, but in, in a different, different manner. Mm. It's just, I just love it. It's fantastic. Do you think there's as much of an appetite to do um, international consultation and things like that now that we're moving into a more technological age and a lot of this information is as accessible because I feel like, you know, individuals such as yourself, have been developed because you've gone through that cyclic learning process so many times through this kind of international exposure. And we saw a little bit of it um, recently. We had a bunch of people over to the UK and you see things like um, FDIC and some of the big some of the big events that you see throughout the year. There is still an opportunity to share that information. But I wonder if we have as many you know, sort of secondments or people go in and spending six months in different organizations. Do you see that as something that is that is still an important part of what we do? Or do you think actually the way that we share information now is just is just more of a digital age? There's no substitute for getting together face to face. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that it'll always be that way. There's different levels, you know, uh, talking on the phone is one in video conferencing is another. But there's really nothing beats that that face-to-face interaction. And it's the exposure after work is as important as the exposure during work. So it's in the evening when you're sitting down over a beer or two and and talking about issues that 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 sort of stuff comes out. You can only do that by getting together with people. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's as strong as it's ever been. But, you know, I've just been very fortunate to have had these opportunities to to do these things. Um, but most of them have been in my own time and on my own coin. Uh, there's okay. times when I've, when I've made a few rubles out of it. But, um... And so you should, to be brutally honest with you. I know that people struggle with that aspect of it. They struggle with, well, it should just be, you know, public service and we should just be doing this for free just because you love the job. But actually, you, you've developed a wealth of knowledge and, you know, what you deliver outside of that is is you as an individual you know i don't think you owe it to your service or anything like that people struggle with that sometimes because uh you know people don't join the emergency services typically to to make a lots and lots of money but you should also be appreciated for the work that you've put in you know, all those personal sacrifices because i wanted to ask you as well like what was the cost of all of that time spent abroad and i don't mean the financial cost but that's time away from from family from friends from from personal relationships you know that that all that travel sounds very exciting to a lot of people and even to myself but there will no doubt have been a cost to you spending so much time away from home cost out of life no doubt yeah i mean i've only got the the one child my daughter she's 24 now but that's was some of the hardest parts of the whole thing is um, particularly when she was little you know before she was before she started going to school um it really was very hard uh, leaving it because you, you can't get that time back. They're only mm-hmm. at that age once and 
uh, yeah, that was the toughest. So I had to balance that up uh, and make it up to her. But, you know, she, I used to take her around. Some of, the, some of the gigs I've done, she's come with me. Wow. If, uh, for example, I went to, um, <clears throat> I think I took her over to Germany with me in 2007. And we went from Germany to Croatia. So we were about three or four weeks. She was traveling with me there. Uh, she, I got her over to Malaysia uh, for a couple of days while I was working in Malaysia. Then we went to the States. I was working with uh, IFSTA on uh, their fire grant support operations book. So um, I went in. That's right. I, I made it up. I went in t- two weeks early. So I took it to Disneyland, and then we drove across to Oklahoma, drove across the states through Utah, the Grand Canyon, wow. uh, over to Oklahoma, and then we went. We flew from there over to the UK uh, to uh, Cambridge. The IFE meeting was on in Cambridge, so she was. So and then the way back, we stopped over Singapore. So that was about five weeks that she was with me. Then, that is an incredible experience to be able to share with you. Yeah, guys. yeah, we, we've done some pretty cool stuff together, and um, but the biggest one was the Churchill Fellowship. Um, I know she was uh, about eleven or twelve at the, the time, and oh, you know, she's at that age where you do, do you want to take them out of school for for ten weeks and. But then this is an opportunity of a lifetime. So, you know, we ended up taking you with me. Um, so we did um, two weeks in New York, a uh, week in Canada, a week in Germany, a week in Austria, a week between Malmo and Sweden and Denmark. We went to Oslo, then Switzerland. So <laughs> oh, she's uh, seen a bit of the world that kid. Talk to us about the, so, the Church of Fellowship, what, what that was and how that came about. Well, that was my third attempt. So I'd had a, a, a go at a fellowship uh, probably, I don't know, 12, 14 years before that and didn't get past first base and tried again a couple of years later and didn't get past first base. So I'd really given up on it. And then around about 2009, we were building, we went from, virtually having no tunnels of consequence in Brisbane to having the three, now we've got the three largest road tunnels in Australia, about five kilometres long. Hmm. So that's that's going on. And then I'm also been asked to manage the implementation of the compressed air frame systems. So they've said to me, oh, Shane, will you, will you come into the headquarters for a month? Said, no, three months. I said, no, I'll give you a month. I'll come in for a month and get this CAPS stuff up and running and then I'll go back on shift. Well, I've been, better, been there about a fortnight and I said, oh, shit, when it come to this meeting, there's a meeting on, on the tunnels. You know, would CAFs be any good in the tunnels? Well, yeah, it could be good. And I come along to the meeting. So uh, by the time the meeting had finished, I'd found myself uh, being asked to manage the operational preparedness for the new tunnel. Bloody hell. So I thought, oh, boy, that's going to be like a year and a half. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, but it was it was so interesting. It was a really, uh, the, it was about halfway through construction. It was just so fascinating. So I thought, yeah, okay, all right, off the bullet. I'm going to be here for a year and a half. And then I was really enjoying the project. And after a couple of months, I thought, you know what, this would be a good topic for a church or fellowship. And um, a friend of mine from South uh, from South Australia, Len Batley, was a church or fellow, and I was talking to him. And I said, oh, I'll give it one more go. And he said, yeah, well, you should. He says, it took me three attempts. I said, really? I was quite amazed. And he said, yeah, yeah, right, go ahead. It was my third attempt before I got my Churchill fell up. So I said, right. I rolled my sleds up. I said, I'll have another go at it. So this time around, it was successful. So, uh, yeah, that took me right around the world. It was uh, about 10 weeks in about eight countries. So for uh, people, including just... myself, that are completely unfamiliar with the concept of a fellowship, what 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 does it actually have to do to attain it and, and sort of what was entailed within the completion of it? Okay, so it's the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust and I think it's Canada, Australia mm-hmm. and the UK, the only countries that, that have got that, that trust. And it's designed to allow Australians to travel overseas to get knowledge and experience that can benefit Australia that can only be gained overseas. So obviously if there's a topic that's... Uh, you know, that you can learn within Australia, knowledge within Australia, then you're not going to get a fellowship. So it's it's about giving people the opportunity to go overseas and uh, study. And it's it's really, it's diverse. Um, you know, some of the 
people get fellowships for um, studying uh, breeding Bavarian uh, or Bavarian bulls or something or other. So there's <laughs> obviously there's, there's you know there's a lot of medical there's a lot of medical fellowships. So doctors yeah. are going over and studying new techniques, psychologists, uh, music, art. So when if you had a dinner, a Churchill Fellowships dinner, around the table you get it's an incredibly diverse group of people. Oh, and, and emergency services they they also have fellowships for for emergency services as well. So um, yeah, just a really fantastic organisation. So what you have to do is convince them. You don't have a lot of words. You've got the application form, you've got, and you've got to you know, convince them that, that what you're doing is going to benefit Australia in some way, and you can't get the knowledge in Australia. So I did a did a, a good um, application form and application, good interview, and, and I was successful. And that was the fellowships generally are about six weeks, and they work out. You know, you say, I want to go here, there, and there. And there's like a daily rate for living in that country. And so they say, there's a, there's a block of money. Um, it's yours. They, they pay for the air fees. And then you get this swag of money. And they say, spend it wisely. Because if you run out, you're not going to get any more. <laughs> so it's up to you then to manage, manage that, that funding. So I managed to stretch mine out. Uh, I think it was about 10 weeks in total. Uh, wow. I, was, I was traveling around. So, yeah. And then when you come back, yeah. is it just a case of you, you you utilize that information with writing policies, or do you have to deliver mm. a package of what you've actually learnt? Or yes, yeah, so there's a Churchill Fellowship report that you have to present. That is, of course, quite a bit of work involved in doing that. So it was an overview, basically, of what I saw in each country, what were the key points and uh, lessons learned, and that sort of stuff. So. Uh, and that's that's your obligation to, to publish that. So I published that um, uh, to complete my fellowship. Then after that, really as a Churchill Fellow, you've got, got an obligation to keep passing on that knowledge. So I've done a couple of conferences around the world where I've talked on, on the subject of um, operating in tunnels, you know, firefighting in tunnels and preparation and planning. And, and I've done a little bit of consultancy recently with the Snowy Hydro Project and the Sydney Metro. So, yeah, I'm still involved. I'm still using that knowledge to make Australia safer. Take us there for a minute then. What are the, what are the, some of the main points that you tend to cover when it comes to firefighting in tunnels? Because this will be quite a foreign uh, subject for a lot of people, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was it was certainly new to us. Um, and we have went from no tunnels to three of the largest in Australia. But, but I tried to take my firefighters hat off and look at it from different perspectives. So from a person who's constructing a tunnel, someone who's operating a road tunnel or a rail tunnel, uh, other emergency services. So I try to have a very broad perspective on the, uh, the whole issue there and saw a lot of lot of diverse tunnel geometries. Uh, the New York Fire Department, they were just fantastic. I mean, mm. that subway system over there is it just you know, it's one of the biggest, one of the biggest in the world, Definitely. and it's old too. It's got a lot of legacy stuff there. So, I've got to look at that geometry, and I studied a, a train crash uh, in, in Toronto, um, and then so I, I was able to look at rail and road. And in Switzerland, uh, there's a training academy there called IFA, International Fire Academy. Uh, just beyond belief, they've got two training sites in Switzerland, and they are by far the best tunnel. Uh, training centers in the world wow if you get a chance have a, have a look at them and yeah <laughs> that, that was the last trip i did there and i've got obviously there's a lot of tunnels in in switzerland uh italy and norway and they've got a lot of legacy construction so some of them are 15 kilometers 17 kilometers long and they're single tube bi-directional traffic you know <laughs> Whereas, you know, we've got more modern tunnels there, uh, unidirectional, there's twin tubes and et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at every, every geometry from a hole that was dug in the ground 100 years ago, and you're lucky to have lighting in there, let alone exits, right up the, the really ultra-modern stuff with fixed firefighting systems and state-of-the-art, everything else. So it was very, very broad uh, look. I got at it, but the, the Swiss really were really impressive and their commitment to excellence in that area is just in a class of its own. Yeah. Just staggering. Um, they took me for a ride in their train. They've got a train um, that responds to emergencies and tunnels. And wow. if you can imagine three 
it was got your main loco with the engine and the girls, <clears throat> and it's decked out with um, almost every break and enter heavy rescue tool you can you can imagine. Then add then multiply it by two. The next carriage has got a fifty thousand liter water tank, uh, massive pumps, compressed air frame systems, all things to do with water and extinguishing. And then the last carriage is pressurized. It's a uh, you can actually they can actually take people in there. They've got a onboard air supply, so they can take people into this carriage and uh, they've got about 30 people they can put in there and they can triage them, they can treat them, they got enough compressed air to last for 24 hours. It just, it just, like you can't describe it. And they've got 12 of them. (laughs) 12 12 of these trains. Yeah. I think um, Germany So they would deploy them obviously deep deep into tunnels potentially and be able to, you know, firefight, bring people in on stretches, BA and all that sort of stuff, and then treat them inside their unit. That is incredible. The capability. Yeah. You can't imagine, can you? I mean, and 12 of them, I think Germany had about three of them, Austria too. So the Swiss really are outstanding in in their commitment to safety in those areas. But, you know, they've got all these air supply points, quick fill, you can top up your cylinders. And they've really put a lot of of thought into it. And the training centre is just in a class of its own. It's got road, it's got rail, it's got different geometries. And then the other site that actually bored into a mountain, um, to, to make up that, that particular geometry. So different twin tube, single tube, road, rail, ah, just, yeah, class for time. Mm. I wanted to just cover through, before we wrap it up, around some of the other books that you've obviously gone into around you know the fire dynamics of firefighting, reading fire, fighting fire. What I want to direct, I'm going to try and link in a few of these in the notes for the uh, episode below. But I wonder if you could just take us into the the sort of motivation for writing each of these and uh, why you sort of went into the details that you did beyond 3D firefighting. Well, I've been talking about writing uh, a book on reading the fire for about 20 years now. And I haven't, you know, um, I've written articles and journal stuff, Mm. but um, 3D firefighting was the the biggest I've done for some time. It's actually Ben Walker got me into it. Ben said he was going to write these books. And so he asked me to review the first one. I spent a few hours there on that one there. And he, the next topic was, uh, the first one was fire dynamics with firefighters, fundamental topic. And the next one was going to be reading the fire. So that's something I've been doing for 24, 25 years. Wow. Got a lot of material. So I said, well, let's, let's make it a joint book, this one. So, and so I, I provided a lot of the material for that from existing training packages that I had. Mm-hmm. And then Ben added to that from his perspective. And then we collaborated on the third book, which was Fighting Fire. So, yeah, really uh, massive projects, and you know, Ben really inspired me. Otherwise, I'd still be talking about my next book instead of actually having having written it. But um, it really, um, if you want to understand something, you need to write it and teach it. If you can teach something, then you start to understand it because it's when you start trying to explain something that you challenge your depth of knowledge. Mm. So it was a it was a great experience to to do those and about oh, two years ago now I wanted to self publish I've been reading about self publishing and one, mm. one of the things for three D firefighting was it was very expensive and uh, like I wanted to I used to get an author's discount and I wanted a, I was doing a course in Thailand so I'm like I want to ship six books over to Thailand and I want to ship twelve uh, another six to Croatia. And it was like 500 bucks postage for the one to Thailand. And I said, you know, is there, isn't there a cheaper way of posting? And I don't know where to use this service because, you know, if it gets lost, you know, they've got, they got to replace the books. So it was, was going to cost me $1,100 to, to post uh, 12 books to two countries. Hmm. I thought, there's got to be a better way than that. And yeah, then, it's not then sustainable, is up, it? <laughs> oh, you know, and the book was about 100 and something dollars by that stage as well. So anyway, long story short, we end up self-publishing. So we've rewritten um, Fight in the Mix for Firefighters and Reading the Fire, and we self-published those. And it is just fantastic. Um, a ton of work formatting it. I can assure you that almost broke me. But <laughs> once you've got the manuscript ready, ready for print, um, if you're in Italy, mm. you just go online, or you just tell me, hey, I want a book. I order it, and it's printed. I've got... Um, uh, US currency, US, Australian, Euro, 
and, and the pound. And I just picked the closest location. And they'll print one book and ship it out to you for a, like a fraction of what wow. the traditional bookshops would charge you. Uh, really, it, and it, it just makes it accessible. Because I, I didn't want to have a book that was going to be 120 bucks, 150 bucks. I wanted something that a tight-ass fireman like myself would. Yeah, would that's it. You've got to make it a, you know, able for your <laughs> audience to be able to engage with it. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got the price down to oh, I forget what it is now. Forty-two, something like that, or thirty-seven, yeah, forty-two, something like that. And that includes postage. And if you know, people order several books, we can. We can, you know, cut that back even further. But, mm. but anywhere in the world, uh, I just go in there and pick the local currency. And the, the shipping costs are very modest. They print it within two or three days. It ships out. Um, most places, they get it within a fortnight. It's just Love awesome. It. So what's the? So I mean, we wrote, we'll put a link in the in the notes for this. But what's the best place for people to go to try and source this if they wanted a copy? Well, we've. So um, version two of Fighter and Mixed for Firefighters is self-published. Uh, Reading the Fire version two is self-published as well. So you can do a search and you can order it through Amazon, Kindle, where, where, wherever you want. So it's uh, that's and that's another fantastic thing about self-publishing. Um, if you're if you're in um, Zimbabwe and you, you can order through the local Amazon store in Zimbabwe and, and get it shipped out. Uh, but they can also order it uh, directly through myself or Ben. If they, they email me, um, I can... Um, I can Would you be happy for us to for put them. an email address in, in a contact? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I, think, sure. I, I always, I always you know about people want to do two or three books. We, yeah. Nah, look, no, we do a lot of that. We've done a lot of the, a lot of the sales have, have gone that way and thing is that if, if they want to order three or four books we can give them a discount i can sort of say okay well if you get a board of those we can well, i can do I that i think there'd be great I'm, things to give they, the classes of recruits do you know what i mean and i think people well, you know if people did it 50 50 if service supported half of the payment and then people because I, I i've got so many different books that i've uh, i've purchased over the years and i think it's been a great investment in my own personal development and then the surrealness of actually being able to contact people such as yourself and people were as i said it at the beginning of our well, conversation people the IFE's are been very a receptive supporter. yeah ife new zealand they bought about uh, 30 books of us for that very reason, Pete. To, you know, mm. to give them away for, as gifts, for, you know, for people that have done well in the exams. South Africa, I think I've sold about 50, 60 to, to IFE South Africa. So, uh, yeah. They, Is they, the they, IFE they, they get an international thing still? Because it's gone through different iterations, the Institute of Fire Engineers in the yeah. UK. Um, yes. I don't know whether the exams are still as relevant or popular in certain services because we went through phases of making them a requirement for promotion processes and things like that. But uh, yes. I think that the, the content and their website and all that sort of stuff is great and the references that they provide. But I don't hear it being being put in into into certain services as like essential learning anymore, which I think is a shame because it's a huge body of knowledge there. Mm, yeah. You know, I think there's still about 12,000 members across the world uh, in many different countries and many different disciplines. If you go back to, well, I joined one in 83. It was one of the first things I did was join the IFA as a student. Yeah. And uh, I've gone through all the examination processes and uh, I've actually been honoured enough to be awarded the title of Companion Fellow. So uh, oh, yeah. I've been heavily involved in IFE in Australia and internationally. So I love it. It's been great for me, incredible networking. But if you go back to the 80s, it was mostly senior fire service officers. It was, it was driven by them and the operational ones of the fire service. But they, And there's always been the presence of, of engineering there, but it was sort of secondary. In the last 20 years, it's gone through a renaissance where uh, its relevance in engineering, fire engineering, has really gone through the roof. So we're starting to see it dominated, and probably you know, more members now are fire engineers uh, because they linked up with the Engineering Council in uh, Europe and they're actually able to charter engineers. So, you know, whereas years ago you did the uh, the graduate and you got GI Fire E or MI Fire E, yeah. the way they restructured it 20 years ago now is you when you do those, you then can use those as theoretical qualifications towards getting an engineering, to being chartered yeah. or incorporated, et cetera. So you've still got to have the practical components to add to that, but they've 
so their relevance is is probably as great as ever, if not if not more so. But I think I think it's gone much wider. Towards, yeah, the breadth of knowledge that is yeah. provided by the IOP is is wider than it ever has been. It's more focused on engineering now, the fire fire safety engineering, mm. rather than fire fighting. Mm. Uh, but you know, there's there's still a strong presence in in both disciplines across the world. And the USA branch, I think years ago they had about twenty four members, <laughs> but I think it's really taken off in the states. So they've got a couple of hundred or thousand members now, something crazy. So uh, it's uh, and Hong Kong was I think was the biggest branch outside of the UK, and I think Australia was number two at, at one stage. So, but that's another thing I love about the IFE is you're tapping into a network of people yeah. all over the globe, all over the globe. And it was very good to me because actually John Taylor published a number of papers mm. in the IFE journals. I think it was probably in '92, and that's what got my interest and that's what that's how i got in contact with john taylor so, so many stuff i yeah, need to revisit i'm gonna to have to put them back i've literally made two pages of notes <laughs> of different people to go and speak to and different <laughs> things to go and look at and that, that's what i love so much about these these conversations but looking ahead now you know that you're moving into this uh, chapter of retirement what do you think the next couple of years looks like for you because you said you'd built up this body of work and these contacts but now you're kind of free you know, now you've been released yeah. from that, but also, you know, taking into consideration your, you know, your daughter's in her twenties, she's maybe, you know, starting her own sort of life as well. What does time look like for you moving forwards, and how long do you anticipate, you know, being able to still travel and and, and do some of these adventures? Well, I've got about a four year plan. That, that's my plan because after that, will be mainly theory. I'll be doing from then on. But once again, the IFE has been very good to me, and if you look at people doing compartment fire behaviour instructors courses around the world. There's many different people doing it. And at the end, you get a piece of paper saying you were there. And, you know, that, that's great. And um, But to me, I wanted something that was bigger than my credibility. So okay. I actually went through the recognitions process through the IFE, and it's, it's quite rigorous. So you have to present them, all your policies and procedures, give them examples of, um, you know, you know written material etc so the big process and but that was successful and in 2018 i was awarded a recognized training course so and that has really gone crazy uh, there's obviously there's a demand for for international recognition so it's one thing to say oh yeah i did shane rafael's course you know he's a great bloke rah, rah, rah. Mm. well that doesn't really mean much out, if outside of my circle yeah. friends <laughs> um, whereas, <laughs> whereas at ife recognized training is is bigger than me it's an organization that has a lot of credibility at stake they don't give I, I, and i have to pay for the rights to use that logo yeah i'm, I'm assessed and i'm audited and all the rest of it so it, it carries a, a the stamp of approval from an internationally recognized organization. So that's been really good for me. And um, Israel's been fantastic. I've trained two groups of Israeli officers now. So, and they're really implementing the training programs that, that I've been promoting the last couple of years. So I'm taking great joy in, in seeing their success. Uh, Japan is also heading down the same track, uh, Korea. Uh, so there's so many countries now that I've started to get a bit of a footprint in and they're basing their their whole curriculum their whole training approach off this recognized training course so i get a real buzz out of doing that dude that's such an exciting exciting chapter of life i didn't into and honestly i just you know circle back to the beginning of our conversation i mean just such admiration that you have this level of drive and excitement and i can just hear it in your voice do you know what i mean the <laughs> hunger that you still have for this is uh is truly inspiring sometimes when i hear people becoming disenchanted or you know they're, they're, they're losing a little bit of love for it sometimes i always say that you just need to put yourself around people or you need to engage with people you need to just widen yes. your perspective a little bit yes. you know sometimes if you narrow your world so far down that it's just the people that you're with on a day-to-day -day basis then yeah we can all get down in the dumps about the work but when i hear people like yourself i wonder if it's the fact that you've just been so open to what's happening in the wider world that has kept that almost childlike with the greatest of respect yeah. fascination with the sector <laughs> it's true i i still get excited about it. i still love it you know what i gives me a lot of joy now is is when i see 
my friends from Israel sending me pictures of the latest instructors course they've run. Yeah. All my colleagues from uh, South Korea. I mean, some of the stuff they're doing is just brilliant. They're just taking it to the next level. Yeah, they're doing things that I only would dream about doing. And then and they share it with me, and then I share it with other people. And, you know, Japan, I mean, excited about Japan because their culture, their, their um, very disciplined culture. Mm. And, you know, they, they take things and they implement it in, in a very precise manner. So, you know, when I see those other countries picking up the, the baton, so to speak, and, and making it better, uh, I think that, that's really, that's a good legacy. And, uh, you know, every time I get an email from them or I see a post, it, it keeps me going. Beautiful. Absolutely love it, my friend. Well, look, Thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. I know we tried to get this chat together a couple of times, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day, especially on a weekend, to have this chat. I would love to revisit this maybe in five or six months' time, you know, when you've been and been able to revisit these places now that we're free to travel and you're able to get out there again. Oh, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I'm very honoured, and, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's been great. Thank you for your time, my friend. I really appreciate it, and I will speak to you soon. All right, Pete. Thanks very much, mate. Firefighters podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.